Good morning, everyone. Uh, as everyone joins us, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, we are on series eight uh, of the Partnering to Crush the Curve series. Today's topic is on mental health and wellness during COVID. Uh, we know this is a major issue, especially in the African continent, one that has not gotten a lot of attention recently. And I think one that COVID has really surfaced as a, as a very pressing issue that needs to be addressed. Um, so as you all join, it would be, be great to just let us know in the chat uh, where you're coming from. Um, we see some, I already see some uh, familiar names, uh, some folks that have joined us before. So welcome to everyone who's come before. Welcome to those of you for maybe this is the first time uh, joining us. Uh, so yeah, just let us know maybe your organization, the country you're logging in from. Um, and we'll maybe give it a few more minutes uh, for, for some more folks to join. Um, <clears throat> Ria, hi, Safia, good to see you again. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Um, okay, great. Um, so I think we're, we're a few minutes after the hour and we already have a good number of participants. Um, so maybe, Frank, I'll turn it over to you to, to welcome everyone. Thank you, Ariel. Um, morning, everyone, uh, from wherever you are. Greetings from very cold and freezing Johannesburg. Um, it's five degrees. You wonder if it's discussion African temperature, but so be it. Um, welcome. This is, as Ariel has mentioned, this is the eighth in the series of these joint webinars we've been hosting around uh, crushing the curve, looking at especially how Africa is responding to uh, the COVID crisis and more so uh, on issues related to the most vulnerable in our communities. We are very proud of, of the momentum we've gathered through these uh, webinars and the value we've added to a lot of people. And we hope that we can continue to, to um, add value to you as participants in this series. So thank you for taking the time to come on, on board today. Uh, I want to especially thank the, uh, the speakers who made time to share with us what they have learned, what they have been practicing, their craft, and hopefully we can all live here with something of value to go and implement and, and, and uh, uh, hopefully solve the problem a lot, a lot more creative and a lot better. Uh, I'll hand it over now back to Ariel and uh, wishing you all a, a very delightful webinar. Great, thanks so much, Frank. Um, and my name is Ariel. I'm with the Sankop team. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, and, and we're hosting this series in collaboration with, with ABPA um, just because it's really important to convene people right now and really talk about solutions to, to very real challenges that the African continent is facing. Um, and we're really happy to be doing this with ABPA. Uh, Margaret, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so just to give you guys a quick um, introduction of the speakers that we have lined up. Um, we have Olaide uh, from Dyslexia Nigeria. We have Nomfundo Mogapi uh, from the Center, for, uh, the Center for Study of Violence and Reconciliation. We have Mr. Bright Shitema from Mental360, and we have Dr. Wanjiru Kaigwa, um, who's a Harvard Medical School Clinical Research Fellow. Um, and we'll hear from all of those uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, so Margaret, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so we'll give each of the speakers about uh, seven to eight minutes to speak. I think we, we have reserved about an hour and a half of their time today. Um, and if you have any questions as we go, please put them in the chat box. We'll, we'll field questions to the speakers um, at the end of the presentations. Um, and they, they might you know, be able to respond directly on the chat box as well. So feel free to engage, um, engage that way. And we do ask that you as, as participants just stay on mute. Um, and if you want to make a comment or say anything, you can raise your hand. Um, there should be an option uh, for you to, to sort of raise your hand in the, in the participant uh, window there. Um, so yeah, so we want to definitely reserve a good amount of time for, for Q&A. So we're going to get started here just before our first speaker with a quick audience poll. Um, so we just sort of want to know how you guys are feeling today. Um, it's anonymous, so we don't know who's saying what, <laughs> but given that, that we're doing this session on mental health, we really want to hear from the audience um, how you guys are coming in today and how, you know, how genuinely you're sort of feeling with, with the COVID, uh, you know, situation. I think it's a real drain um, on everyone, and, and I think it surfaced a lot, of, a lot of challenges for a lot of people. So 
Um, so go ahead and, and put your response in. We'll give it maybe another 10 or 15 seconds. Um, and it looks right now like a lot of people are sort of middle of the road. Um, few people doing great, few people doing really poorly. <laughs> um, so most people are about average. Uh, so I'll give it another two or three seconds to please put in your response. Um, and I will show that out. All right. Um, so most people, some days have good, some, some folks have good days, some folks have bad days. Um, so, so we're, as a group, I say we're not doing too badly. That's, <laughs> that's not a bad thing. Um, so thanks for that. I think it's really great to, you know, uh, to see that I think people are not alone and we're all sort of struggling, um, you know, with, with, uh, with this COVID situation. Um, so, uh, Margaret, if you want to go to the next slide, um, I'll call up Nomfundo um, as our first speaker today. Uh, Nomfundo, over to you. Thank you so much for having me from this very cold South African weather. So, what I want to talk about today is um, really understanding why it's important for us to focus on mental health and mental wellness in Africa generally, but I'm coming specifically from an experience uh, from South Africa. And then I hope to just touch base on an initiative that we're doing in partnership with AVPA to try and address some of this. Next one, please. So next one, please, Margaret. So for me, I think in order for us to talk about mental health and mental wellness, we have to really start talking about what was happening in our continent and our country even before COVID had come in. I've been working in this sector for over two decades now, and we have already been saying that mental wellness and mental health is a huge issue in Africa and in South Africa, that we were already a society that was dealing with a lot of historical trauma, transgenerational trauma, collective trauma, that had impacted wounding at a number of levels from individuals, we saw it in families, we saw it in institutions and how people interacted in institutions and even at a societal level. And we were already talking about the importance of addressing mental wellness because our crisis was that as a society, we are a people that were asleep to ourselves, to our emotions, to our psychological states and how it was impacting us and our society. So when COVID came and hit our country, those of us in the sector just knew that the situation that we had was going to be exacerbated by COVID and the impact that it was going to have in significant areas of our lives if we don't consciously ensure that we deal with our mental well-being the, the fault lines that we already have as a society were going to deepen and unfortunately the very same human and social capital that we would need to build the society post-covid would be depleted and deteriorated. So for us really focusing on mental wellness is no longer a luxury, but a necessity in order to help us respond pro appropriately to COVID, but also in enabling a society to be able to build itself after COVID. So if we can just go and just the next slide, please. So some of the things that have just been emerging for us that have highlighted how COVID has exacerbated the mental wellness and mental health in our context is just the way our responses to COVID-19, such as uh, people being quarantined, locked down, has actually fueled some of the psychological issues such as isolation, loneliness. Here in South Africa, some of the communities told us just that the presence of the police and the army in the communities, which our government has decided to bring in order to try and help us to monitor compliance triggered their previous trauma during apartheid. So already just the responses alone to COVID do the opposite at a mental health and mental wellness state. At an individual level, we've talked a lot about how people have experienced fear and anxiety. We have been really concerned about the people who are leaders and managers at the forefront of dealing with COVID because most of have we lost her? Amfundo? 
Yeah, I think I think her internet might have cut out. So um, Namfundo is actually on the road. Why don't we go ahead? Um, maybe Olaide, maybe you can sort of step in because um, I'm not sure um, if if we'll get Namfundo back on the line. Um, but Margaret, why don't we go ahead? Uh, go ahead to Olaide's slides, and we can come back um, if if Namfundo is able to join us back. Um, so sorry for that, um, everyone who's joined us. But um, yeah, we'll we'll try to come back to, to Nomfundo. Hopefully, she'll be able to join us back. For now, um, Olivia, please welcome. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for having me here. I'm very excited to be joining the conversation, especially because I'm going to be talking about dyslexia, which is something a lot of people don't know has a lot to do with mental health. I work with Dyslexia Nigeria and we work with a whole range of stakeholders on dyslexia. So we work with workplaces, schools, individuals um, on dyslexia. And many people who may not know, dyslexia is, is actually is a specific learning difficulty. It's a difficulty that is of neurological origin, which means you're most likely born with the gene that makes you dyslexic. And what dyslexia is, is it's a difficulty with all of the skills that are required for literacy, so reading, writing, and spelling. And that happens with normal to high intelligence. So it has nothing to do with intelligence. It's just the way the brain processes information. And this is really important because 20% of every population is dyslexic. So approximately 40 million Nigerians have dyslexia. Um, and you know, many people think about dyslexia and say, well, as a learning difficulty, it must be limited to schools and children and learning. But because it's something you're born with, it's a lifelong difficulty. And that means that it carries on into adulthood with different symptoms. And that's what we're really gonna be focusing on today. So those symptoms, they typically affect executive functioning. And that's really things to do with your working memory. So how, can you, how long can you hold little bits of information for and then use them for thinking? It affects organization, it affects concentration, and sort of how long it takes you to be able to think through certain problems. And so this can have a really, really strong impact on everyday life and living and working as well. And so you think about things like poor time management, people who are dyslexic struggle with meeting deadlines, for example, being able to structure their time, knowing how to sequence tasks, planning to do lists, you know, with the difficulty with reading and writing sometimes, it means they have to read text over and over again to be able to get proper understanding. It can be difficult to multitask, manage a very heavy workload. It can be difficult following instructions, you know, holding more than three bits of information at a time. Um, and writing as well with grammatical accuracy and a lot of speed. And if you notice, these are things that are with everyone and, and they're, they're skills we need to function in every type of job role. So you can imagine what the, the COVID-19 situation brought, you know, people having to work flexibly, having to work from home, um, and meaning that there are lots of distractions, there are kids at home, that where there's grocery, there's this electricity, there's Wi-Fi problems. And also because people cannot start and close work, you know, at regular hours that they're used to doing. It I mean, so many people are working around the clock. So the pressure on having to cope with, you know, being organized and staying on top of a to-do list and multitasking, it becomes a lot. And what we've seen at Dyslexia Nigeria is so many more people have been able to go through the signs and symptoms of dyslexia and realize, well, actually, I'm struggling with organization. I'm struggling with, with concentration. I'm struggling with juggling all of these tasks. And without the appropriate coping mechanisms, there's a lot of strain on mental health. So people get frustrated, there's anxiety, there's panic, they're not doing as well, um, they're falling behind, they're struggling with new targets, new working environments in their homes. And that's meant that so many more people need support. And that's really where the link between dyslexia and mental health is. Can I go to the next slide, please? Margaret. Next slide, please. Thank you. So having seen so many more people come forward to say, well, I'm having these difficulties. What can you do? What we've then done is we've conducted a lot more diagnostic and workplace needs assessments. And what that really is, is, you know, we have 
a, a rigorous process where we examine and assess someone who might show those signs or symptoms to come up with a profile of strengths and weaknesses and to say, well, going through all of these tests, are you really dyslexic or not? And what can we do to help you? What sort of coping mechanisms can you put in place to better manage some of what you might be having difficulties with? So with that, what it means is we've done a lot more of awareness. So if you follow us on Instagram, follow us on, on Twitter or on Facebook, you'd have seen a lot more about the signs and symptoms of dyslexia. How do I know I'm dyslexic? How do I know my child is dyslexic? How do I know my colleague is dyslexic or my employee or you know, my manager, for example? Um, and what does that look like in everyday life? Having done that, we are online 24 seven for you to book a consultation, 15 to 30 minutes to have a, com a conversation with one of our experts to say, well, I feel like I have these signs, what can I do next? And then we can have you know, more of a conversation with you about what your work situation is or your life situation is or study situation is and what your, maybe what your kids are going through. You know, spending time with them at home as well in this time has meant lots of parents have also been able to see where their kids are struggling. Um, and so brief consultations can then lead into assessments where we can properly diagnose dyslexia and come up with a profile of strengths and challenges and then recommend strategies and support signing up onto a therapy program that allows you to put in place strategies that help you cope better and improve your, your mental health. So that's what we've been doing, um, you know, especially in, during COVID-19. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what have we learned? I mean, th there's so many things that we've learned, but you know, I'm just restricting it to two main things we've learned now. The first is in our environment, there's no legislation that actually protects the needs of people who have specific learning difficulties like dyslexia. Um, so whereas we have people who think about disabilities or challenges as something that they have to look after by law, we don't have any legislation that currently covers that. So we've had to do a lot more work to create awareness of what dyslexia is and how prevalent it is. There are 22 million working Nigerians with dyslexia. There's at least three kids in every classroom that is dyslexic. So everyone needs to have an idea of what it is and how prevalent it is and how easy it is to put in some reasonable adjustments that make people with these difficulties to excel. Um, so that's something that, that we've learned that we really have to engage and create more awareness um, to let more people know about dyslexia and to see it's not a disease, it's not anything to be ashamed of, it's just something most of us have that we need to manage. And that also has lots of strengths, you know, so most people with dyslexia are highly creative, they're great entrepreneurs, they're great at idea generation. So many people that we know are successful are actually dyslexic. Steve Jobs of Apple was dyslexic, Winston Churchill was dyslexic, Will Smith, dyslexic. So many people, um, uh, Richard Branson, people who are so successful, and that's because they've been able to find strategies to cope with dyslexia and have a, a much better, healthier approach to it that helps them succeed. The second thing we've learned is that subsidy is actually very important. So on a normal day, if people recognize that they have challenges like this, they're willing to put funds towards it to get support. Um, but with the pandemic, what happens is, you know, demand becomes elastic. There, there's so many other things that people want to put money to. They're prioritizing the basics of food, water, shelter, and many people are not thinking that they actually need to invest in their mental health. But without investing in that, everything else you're trying to put money towards suffers. So if you can't focus at work, you can't multitask, you can't keep on top of your workload, the likelihood that you can keep your job is, is, is lower. So you really need to be able to invest in your mental health. Well, what that means for us is, you know, we've realized subsidy is very important. We need to be able to get funds, therapy that they need to cope with, um, with dyslexia and cognitive challenges. So um, needing to be able to meet people halfway and perhaps part fund the costs of training is, is something we've learned that's very important. May I go to my last slide, please? Uh, next slide, please. 
Thank you very much. So that just goes right into the help that we need at the Sex in Nigeria. We are currently raising funds to subsidize the cost of diagnostic and workplace needs assessments so that more people can afford them. And that means more people can take, can take it on even as they have to put their um, you know, regular salaries and paychecks to, to basic needs. We also need avenues to create more awareness, so avenues like this where we can speak to a lot of people, but also opportunities with mass media engagement, television, radio, whatever platforms there are that we can speak to a lot of people, to organizations, to parents, to employees, to schools, to the government about dyslexia and the fact that so many of us have um, you know, some slight challenges with you know, processing information just a slightly different way and we need some help. And leading to that, we need subsidy for therapies to be able to help people afford, you know, um, going on therapy for a while to improve working memory, to improve concentration and organization and basic skills that we need to properly manage our lives and our workload and, and in that regard, improve our mental health. That's for me thank you that's my I hope I hope I kept the time I know times are very important at the moment no thank you so much idea I think <clears throat> you made some really in, important points about how this is really part of everyday life and and despite the fact that maybe it's not as recognized as as it should be um, particularly uh, you know in the regions where we're working um, in sub-saharan Africa um, I see Nomfundo has has joined us back um, Nomfundo are you available to, to sort of pick up uh, where you left off. I know we, we lost you and you are making some really fantastic points. Some uh, I will un- yeah. Hi. Hi guys, yes, I'm here. Sorry about that. Great. Okay, so Margaret, maybe we can just go back to Nomfundo's slides. Um, and and yeah, sorry, sorry about the, the connectivity problems there. Um, feel free to, to go ahead and maybe pick up you know, where, where you, where okay. you dropped off. Yes. So what I was then um, just saying really was that our COVID-19 has exacerbated the situation concerning both the human and social capital that we're going, we're going to need, both to respond to COVID-19, but also to rebuild our societies after COVID-19. And I think for me, what the most important thing that we need to get out of this meeting is for us to begin to advocate for the importance of highlighting mental wellness as no longer just a luxury and it's not even a necessity, but it's a critical component of the fight towards ensuring that our societies are able to survive COVID-19. The next slide, please. So just in terms of uh, our responses, um, you were called in by the African Venture Philanthropy Alliance uh, through Frank to start a mental wellness initiative here in South Africa. So we've started this and we are working with people across the country who are working on mental wellness issues. And the idea for us is first of all, to really advocate for the prioritization of mental wellness in our country, considering the appreciation of the context that we were operating in prior COVID-19, the current context, and just the importance of the mental wellness of our people, our leaders, and the institutions that we will be working in if we are to survive the schedule of this violence. So really advocacy has become an important thing. And for us, the reason advocacy is also important is about enabling us as mental wellness practitioners to know how to build a business case for mental wellness. Because for us, it makes sense, but for people who are really critical at ensuring that our country recovers, they don't understand why it is so important. They don't fully appreciate the extent of the damage that has happened at a mental wellness level for our society. So how do we then begin to bring people who don't speak the same language as us, but who can help us to translate our language so that those that have the investment that are making the decisions are able to prioritize mental wellness. And so advocacy really becomes important. And what we are also doing, what we're finding in South Africa is that for the past decades, there is so many of us doing great work. 
not sufficiently coordinated. And if we are to do that, be crucial that we upscale mental wellness initiatives. We come with creative ways of how do we enable collectives and societies to facilitate healing at large scales. So some of the interventions that we are having that I just want to speak to and then I close is for example, we have prioritized working at schools. Our schools are reopening. The, the principals as leaders are themselves stressed. The teachers are stressed, the students are stressed. So how do we really collectively as a sector ensure synergy, but also ensure that we upscale our initiatives? We've also focused on leadership. I think sometimes when we do these initiatives, we underestimate the importance of those in leadership to be able to deal with their own uh, trauma. And when we talk to them, we really encourage that they do leadership coaching, they do leadership support, because when these leaders uh, have these levels of burnout and they go out there and they lead from the space of being wounded, then we are in trouble uh, as a society. The final area we're focusing on is working with frontline workers, but also again specifically on some of the people who are making very tough management decisions around uh, mental health. So I think just in closure, the last slide please, what I just really wanted to, 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 to highlight today more than anything is the advocacy part that for us as Africa, our greatest resource and even South Africa in relation to responding to COVID is the people. And therefore we need to begin to talk about investment in human and social capital and seeing dealing with mental health and mental wellness as a critical component of that investment. Because I think that's the language that those who are investing in COVID-19 really understand. We need to get out of our rooms and one-on-one -on -one counseling and come up with creative ways of helping our societies deal with this collective trauma that is actually impacting historical trauma. So thank you for having me guys, that's all. Great, thank you so much, Nampundo. Um, I'm glad you were able to join us back uh, despite the connectivity challenges. Um, Nampundo might not be able to stay with us for the entire webinar. Um, so so we'll, we'll try to, to keep her with us as long as we can. Um, before we go to our next speaker, we're just gonna take a quick pause um, to just to, to run a, a second poll really quickly. Um, and what we want, and we heard some of these challenges addressed uh, by our first two speakers, but we really want to understand from you, uh, from our audience, why you think mental health remains neglected uh, as a health concern, specifically um, for, for Africa, because we, we know that this is not, not very well, there's a lot lack of awareness, there's a lot, maybe social stigmas associated, maybe there's a lot of misinformation floating around. Um, so we just want to hear from you where, where you think some of the challenges are. I think when people like Nomfundo talk about advocacy, I think it's important to understand what are we advocating for. Um, so we'll give it maybe another, another five, 10 seconds. So please go ahead, put your responses in uh, before, we, before we share this. Um, so thanks, a lot of people have already put in their responses. We'll give it another three seconds. Quick, quick, put your last answers in. Um, and let's share this. So social stigma is a very, very real issue, sort of overwhelming, uh, looks like 70% of people are saying that's a social stigma associated with mental health, there's a real issue. Um, and very closely related to this, you know, around a lack of awareness relating to signs and symptoms of, of mental health distress. So thanks everyone for, for your responses. Um, and my colleague George is telling me uh, on the line that, uh, in case, I know most of the people when we took the first poll said that nobody said they needed help, um, but we do have some resources that we'll share um, with, with you guys in case or some of your colleagues you know uh, you need to talk to someone. Um, and I'll, I'll let George sort of post, post that information in the chat and we'll circulate that also post the webinar. Um, so thanks so much for your feedback on that. Um, and I will hand it over to Bright who will be our next speaker. And Margaret, if you can go ahead to Bright's slides. Um, Bright, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, hi, hi guys, hope you're doing well. I'm really excited to be here. My name is Bright Shitemi. 
I'm the founder and executive director of Mental360, which is a youth-led, youth-focused organization that uh, raises awareness of, uh, on mental health and supports uh, young people and the wider community uh, by uh, offering a holistic and affordable solutions um, in uh, therapy, physical wellness, and art therapy. So, um, uh, next slide, please, Margaret. Yeah, so uh, in the COVID-19 uh, period, we've been offering um, online counseling and telecounseling. This is where people are able to reach out to us by our helpline number. If you look at the poster on the right, you'll see our helpline number, which is 0776-543-099. And anyone can actually reach out to us from anywhere in Africa. If you just put at plus 254, uh, the country code for Kenya, you'll be able to uh, access uh, therapy services. Uh, we have uh, we have a social enterprise model where we ask people to uh, pay what they can afford. Uh, we take them through a screening process to be able to ascertain what their economic situation is, um, and then uh, of a, a, a customize a package for them. Um, and so we also do referrals to our helpline for people who are in need of maybe police intervention, uh, food donations economic uh, economic strife or difficulties have been a, a big factor uh, during this period of COVID-19. Uh, we also do hospital referrals uh, to those who need hospitalization. Um, uh, the other thing we've been doing is virtual support groups uh, where through WhatsApp and our online platforms, we'll be able to inter interact with people, uh, uh, people who are living with uh, mental health uh, challenges who get to learn from each other. And uh, all this is being overseen by our group of psychologists. Um, we also do webinars, and this is uh, one of them, uh, with companies, uh, with individuals, young people in community. And we are looking to, um, someone who can do, should be on mute, please. Yeah, we are looking to, uh, with resources, go into SMS-based uh, psychological first aid training. We see the need to devolve uh, the, the, the not let me not use the word expertise, but the, the know-how on how someone or a lay person can deal with someone who's going through a mental health challenge. And especially with pandemics such as this, it's possible to move these trainings to SMS based for the people who are not online. So the other thing we've been doing is a lot of awareness on our social media pages. Please check us out on uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and Twitter. You'll find all those handles on our website. Next slide, please. Yeah, so what are, what are some of the things we've, we've observed uh, during this period in Lant? Uh, number one is that suicide and suicide ideation rates are increasing. Uh, already, uh, suicide has been a big challenge uh, the world over, with it being the second leading cause of death among young people between the ages of 15 to 20, 29. And for us, uh, Mental 360, we target people between the ages of 15 to 35. Um, and so in the last decade, uh, as of 2019, the suicide rates had gone up by 58%. And in the COVID-19 period from the calls coming in, uh, almost 60% of the people who are reaching out are people who are actually going through suicide ideation at this point in time. Uh, number two is an increase in sexual and gender-based violence. Um, again, as of 2019, we already had a crisis in Kenya with um, th about 380,000 Kenyan teenagers, uh, you know, uh, having gone uh, either rape or uh, con uh, I mean sexual exploitation and having to bear children at a very young age. There was a new article in the papers yesterday where we had really astonishing numbers uh, coming out um, uh, where this crisis was again uh, uh, doubled, even tripled. Um, and then we have number three where we have a lot of relapse from, from people who are already living with mental health challenges. Uh, the people who are uh, struggling with substance abuse, um, anxiety, depression, uh, due to the situation uh, with the lockdown and quarantine conditions uh, and reduced access to mental health professionals and medication, a lot of relapses um, have been seen. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and some of the learnings you're picking out as an organization from these and some of these are issues you're already working on is uh, we see a huge gap for our mental health app 
Um, and and Nomfundo has just talked about how do we uh, move out of one-on-one -on -one sessions on how do we then uh, transfer the power or knowledge to someone who's going through the challenge. And technology is going to be a key resource moving forward. And uh, in the African and especially now for us Kenyan context and the people we are targeting, the youth, uh, we see a huge need for a customized mental health app for the needs of the youth. And this is something we are working on and we're looking to get more partners and support to get it accomplished. Um, number two is uh, the key reasons for poor mental health among the youth in Kenya are trauma. Uh, these are rising from experiences either from childhood, um, a lot of uh, sexual um, exploitation and violence issues and economic related stresses. And so for us uh, moving forward, we see that uh, any awareness work done um, or anything done towards mental health should be coupled with and I'll mention this later with economic empowerment um, and uh, filling the, inter the information gap by raising more awareness. And we see, again, as I mentioned earlier, doing SMS-based trainings will uh, help, especially in periods of pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so what do we need uh, to scale? Uh, as, as an organization and as organizations working uh, in mental health in, in Africa. Uh, number one, as I mentioned earlier, we see a need for a contextualized uh, mobile phone app. Uh, these will need a lot of financial support and technical expertise. Um, number two, as an organization, we need more investment in human resource in, in our programs. Uh, for example, with the therapy, at some point then you get overwhelmed because there are so many people who are in need of uh, support and uh, you have uh, less resources in terms of human resource to meet this uh, demand. Uh, we also see a need for professional mentorship. Uh, being a, a young organization led by young professionals uh, would really benefit a lot from uh, mentorship from uh, our peers, I mean, our, our people, people who are more experienced. Um, number three, we see a need in uh, investment in scalable awareness platforms. And uh, Nomfundo has just talked about also um, getting out of the one-on-one -on -one sessions to reach uh, more people and reach communities. And we see the use of art as a powerful tool. Um, please mute. Uh, we see the use of art as a powerful tool uh, to reach out to uh, actually the glo to global levels. And so uh, in this, we are working on a, on, a, on a festival. We had the inaugural event called Cradle Arts Festival. Please look it up. Uh, it's actually using poetry, music, theater to discuss social issues, to discuss mental health and raise awareness on a global and powerful scale. And so for this, we also need a lot of financial support, networking and partnerships across uh, the continent and across the world. Um, last slide, please. Margaret. Yeah, so uh, feel free to reach out to us. That's my personal line there, 0710-256-888. As I mentioned earlier, our helpline is plus 254-776-543-099. Anyone can reach out from anywhere. We'll be able to offer uh, phone counseling. We'll be able to offer a Zoom or Skype uh, counseling in, in this moment. And our website is www.mental360.org.ke. Thank you so much. Fantastic, right? Thank you so much. And, and especially thanks for the, the contact numbers. I know that some folks were asking about that in the chat as well. Um, and we've had some good questions come in, uh, Bright. So I'll come back to you uh, shortly for those. Um, but for right now, um, I'll hand it over to Do Dr. Wanjiro Kaigua um, as our last uh, speaker, and then we'll come over to Q&A. Um, so Dr. Wanjiro, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, such an, a privilege and an honor to address you as we discuss mental health and well-being in COVID-19. I am uh, the lead resource mobilization in the National Business Center of the Jones Coronavirus. This was Sorry, Dr. Wanjiru, your, your voice is a bit soft. Um, if you could maybe just move a little bit closer to your speakers or just, just speak up a little bit. We're having a hard time hearing you. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's much better. Thank you. Oh, okay. So I'll, I'll take it from the top. Um, thank you so much for having me. And 
as we discuss this mental health and well-being in COVID-19. So I will be approaching it from a multi-sectoral approach towards building resilience, both for individuals and for the society. I am the lead resource mobilization in the that was established uh, March 16th and is a coalition of players in both the health sector, the public sector, the corporate SDG, the Rotary, I've just been joined by someone from the Rotary, um, and several corporate organizations who have come together or convened under the MSK to give a business response or response to the COVID crisis. So my bias is towards mental health and digital. Um, so I'd just like to explain the background of, of where we are, informed by where we were with the Spanish flu, and four waves were seen at the time of the Spanish flu, and four waves are being seen now. Um, and this corresponds to the increase in morbidity and mortality, which is the death and illness resulting from, once the illness itself, that would be the first wave. So you have death. Uh, um, at, at the moment, with and mortality from illnesses that have been neglected. As it were, um, there was a very high incidence of non communicable diseases. So, this is particularly diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, chronic obstructive lung disease, and cancer. So, there was a, already a very high rate of death from these illnesses. And what you have now is that patients are avoiding going to hospital fear of the virus or because they do not have access. And as a result, you have decompensation. So for a patient who has been managed for diabetes, they have not been going to hospital. So you'll have deaths resulting from these patients who had kidney disease or not, have not been attending the dialysis sessions, patients who had cancer and have not been getting their chemotherapy sessions, um, patients who have hypertension and now present with stroke and, and, and sometimes death, unfortunately. The third wave we expect to see is the effects of malnutrition and undernutrition, issues of food security because of access, uh, because of the economic situation arising from this illness. And then finally, we have the mental health effects, which is what brings us here today. So we will have mental health effects from both a combination of the three, which is the professors that are brought about by this um, wave as well as the psychiatric implications of the illness. So as it is now, it has been documented that there have been psychiatric manifestations of COVID-19. After the Spanish flu, there was actually an uptick, not only because of the stressors that these diseases caused, but because of the physiological effects of this illness on the brain. Um, there, there was a need for more, um, at the time they called them asylums, but they are mental health facilities. And so, Mental health, as we look at it, is a, is, a, is a spectrum and is actually affected by a lot of, 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 of external factors, um, as Bright and as Nungupo um, highlighted earlier. So for us as the National Business Compact on Coronavirus and the partner organizations that are under us, we're looking at mental health as in a much broader perspective, as opposed to just one person's illness. Just to explore mental health on its own, I'm just going to broadly categorize three categories. So in the first category, we have people who have psychiatric manifestations of illness. So we have people who have depression, we have people who have anxiety disorders, we have personality disorders, we have bipolar disorders, mood disorders, and schizophrenia. So that is one, one category of people who are already and who already had psychiatric manifestations and either were or were not getting treatment for these illnesses. Um, as, as, as Bright highlighted, that there is a ra large group of people who were not already receiving treatment for illnesses that they had. So already we can just pack that as what was already happening and will probably continue to happen, as well as the ones who have, who are not continuing to, who stop getting well, under care, but will stop receiving care because of the effects of COVID. So in our second category, we have people who are predisposed either genetically um, or because of a background of trauma to mental illness. So let me give you an example. You might have somebody who's genetically predisposed to schizophrenia, but has never had a trigger. 
And so what COVID has now presented is a set of unique circumstances that can act as a trigger for somebody who otherwise may not have been triggered towards illness. Um, a, a woman turning 30 in the, in the time of COVID might act very differently from a woman turning 30 before COVID. She may have, one may have had, they both may have had a predisposition to bipolar disorder, but somebody who is turning, who is reaching a milestone, is triggered by the circumstances into an illness that they previously did not have and they necessarily did not have to develop. The third group of people, which is where the large population falls, is the people who do not have a, a, a background of, of trauma or do not have a background of genetic predisposition to mental illness and have not had much psychiatric manifestations. And so for this group of people, which is actually the larger population of people, you want to prevent them falling either into negative, negative patterns, um, alcohol, um, alcoholism, drugs, aggression, and, and suicide. And so this is a group of people that the intervention that you do for this group of people is very different from the intervention that you would necessarily have for the first group of people who have psychiatric manifestations and the second group of people who have a predisposition. There will be some overlap, but how you look and address all of these three groups is different. Now, for the, for the majority of people, we have to think about safeguarding the most vulnerable. So even in this larger group of people, there will be, and as it turns out, men are actually the most vulnerable. Already before um, COVID-19 came, suicide was one of the leading causes of death amongst men. Um, and Africans, unfortunately, because of their resource, their limitation, limited resources, also had a higher predisposition to mechanisms and mental illness. So as we look at that, we have to look, we have to think broadly about dynamic interventions for each of these three groups. Now, um, I'm just going to move on to what we are uh, doing as the NBCC and as our partner organizations. Next slide, please. Communication, we, they are, one of our biggest interventions has been communicating about the illness and ways to prevent it, personal protective measures and providing a means to, to do so by providing hand washing stations and reducing stigma because of, of the illness. Then we have uh, one of our partners, the AMREF, is implementing mental health care through training of community health workers. Um, we're also working with the Ministry of Agriculture to enhance food security and to communicate ways of coping um, that also include interventions in taking control planting gardens, um, kitchen gardens. And then finally, we have what is in the pipeline is a helpline by the Rotary. And this is going to be um, a toll free line with medical workers. Um, and I, I'd like to emphasize the importance of community health workers in this, in, in this whole dynamic, because a lot of people are not aware that they need mental health care. So what you, what, why it's important is because they generate demand for health care services. For example, antenatal care services, you have a woman who's expectant, but she doesn't know that she needs antenatal care. So a, uh, a community health worker communicates the importance of, say, antenatal care, and this woman now becomes somebody in need of the service. So she generates a gender that they need the service, unless it is communicated to them, unless somebody identifies them at the grassroots level that this is a problem, um, they, will may, they may not approach anybody for help. Um, and so in all these interventions, actually, we are still scaling, still learning, and still wanting to learn and share as much as possible. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Dr. Wontiro, did, did you also want to mention the, on the last slide? Go ahead. I, I think I covered it before. Okay. So it's okay. what you know all of this thing, yes. Yeah. Super, okay. Thank, thank you. you so much, Dr. Wontiro. <laughs> Um, and once again, thank you so much to, to all of the speakers. We've had some really fantastic questions uh, come in. So please keep go ahead and, and putting them in, in the chat box. Um, I will 
start uh, with Olaide. Um, there have been uh, several questions, Olaide, who came that, that came in around dyslexia in the workplace. Um, so questions around how do you work with colleagues who have dyslexia? Um, what, what happens if it's not addressed in the workplace and sort of what can people do to help? So um, I think it sort of people want to know if, you know, how does that affect people in the workplace? How do you deal with colleagues who might have dyslexia in the workplace? Um, it would be great to hear from you on that. Yeah, thank you so very much. I've seen some of the questions on the chat and I started responding to some actually. I think that they're absolutely exceptional questions and really think that everyone who thinks about this needs to ask. Um, the first thing, I think what I'm gonna do is answer them together um, because they're both, they're two sides of one coin. Um, the, the first side is what can you do if someone near you is dyslexic in the workplace? And the second one is what can you do if you are dyslexic in the workplace? Uh, and that's sort of the way I look at the, um, the questions. But if anyone would like me to explain anything any further, I'd be very happy to. So basically I start by saying, well, I'll just give a brief uh, context as to what dyslexia can affect. And then when we look at the different areas that it affects, we can then look at things that we can do to support people who might be dyslexic, but also what you can do um, to get help. So the first one I mentioned briefly during the presentation is people who are dyslexic likely have a, a challenge with working memory. So being able to hold information for a few seconds in the brain and then use it, manipulate it and use it for thinking. The second one is processing speed. So just the, the, the time it might take to arrive at you know, an answer, a solution, a thought. It's not that the person doesn't know um, what it is, and it's not that their brain works slower. The way I would just describe it is, um, it's, it's imagine taking a scenic route somewhere. So instead of jumping in the car and going from A to B, you decide to take a walk and go by the park and pick, pick some flowers and then arrive at B, right? And then the, the third one would be visual stress. So some people with dyslexia experience words jumping around on the page. Sometimes white is a bit too bright. Um, you know, uh, they, they might experience some blurring, shadowing of text, and all of those can affect reading, concentration, focusing, being able to write, express themselves properly on paper. And there's also the last bit, which is phonological awareness. So that's really looking at manipulating language to communicate what you want. Um, and looking at how um, words themselves convey meaning. So sometimes mixing up words that sound alike. So, so whether, whether, W-E-A-T-H-E-R, the weather, and whether something is right or wrong. You can see sometimes people spelling the same thing different ways in, in a piece of text, and also mixing up what those meanings could be. So if you think about you know, some of those areas as, oh, the last one being automaticity. So um, learning something to the point where you can do it without thinking. And you can imagine the different ways that you, we need automaticity in everyday life. For example, with driving, when you learn how to drive and you're on the wheel, that's not the time you need to start thinking about, oh, what goes first? Is it the clutch or, um, or the brakes? Um, so, so when you think about the different spheres in which dyslexia can affect the way a person processes information, then you can think about how you can support someone near you who might be dyslexic. So we'll start with the mental health, emotional bit, which is please recognize that they are trying very hard. Um, one way that we like to explain this at Dyslexia Nigeria is, imagine if two people have a bowl of spaghetti and everyone is used to having a fork where you just twirl the fork and it's in spaghetti and you can pick it up and put it in your mouth. And some people who are dyslexic have a spoon. They're probably trying really, really hard to pick up the spaghetti with the spoon, but it'll keep falling off unless you can teach them a specific strategy of perhaps bending the spoon and then turning the spaghetti around the neck of the spoon. Then they can eat like everyone else but until they have some support strategies, it becomes really tough for them. And they're putting in a lot of effort, actually, a lot more perhaps than other people who just have a fork. So please recognize that they're trying very hard. Don't bully them, don't degrade them, don't make them feel stupid or less than capable. Then none of those things, they just need some reasonable adjustments. Now, if we look at what working memory does, how you can help with, if, if a person is struggling with their working memory, please give precise instructions. You know, don't go off um, you know, saying this and then distracting them with something else and then coming back to another, you know, instruction. 
give exactly what you want to be done um, very clearly, use very straight language, no idioms. People with dyslexia sometimes take things very literally, um, so you don't want to be using idioms as well. And you want to, you know, give your instructions in small bite-sized chunks. So think about giving not more than three instructions at a time. You know, whereas other people might be able to hold six to nine bits of instructions, people with dyslexia can manage about three. So just stick to about three and encourage them to write down information. They come with you with a pen and paper, please let them write it down or let them record what you're saying if they're in the meeting let them use and listen to you. it's a very simple reasonable adjustment we can make um, with processing speed remember going you don't want to um, put them on the spot perhaps in a meeting and just call on them to say something give them a heads up ahead of the meeting I'm gonna be asking you to explain what happened with you know I don't know the numbers last week let them know what's coming. So they have time to have thought about what they want to communicate. You put them on the spot, they likely might just freeze and then, you know, it becomes embarrassing for them, it becomes embarrassing for everyone. And, and they do know what they're trying to say, they just need a bit more time. Um, so give them some time. And also with writing tasks, they might need a little bit more time to complete writing and reading tasks, but also embrace technology. Assistive technology is, is so simple. A lot of it is free and that helps people to get through lots of text. So you have text to speech software, speech to text software. Some already come with your, with your computer. So I know Microsoft has text to speech. Um, you have Grammarly that can help you. It's very, it's free. You can download it. That can really just help you go through the structure of what you're writing, suggest new ways to express what you're trying to say. Um, so assistive technology is great. You can have dictaphones to record things and play them back. Um, find out what their preferred communication style is. Sometimes they would prefer if you just said things to them verbally or if you showed it as a, as a diagram visually rather than give them a 50 page document to go through. Um, that could really help as well. Um, and then as an employer, you want to think about incorporating um, pre-employment screening, doing your recruitment. So you can identify people who are coming on your team that show some signs of dyslexia and you can put in some reasonable adjustments to help them excel on the job. Um, you could work with experts to do that. For example, we do that at Dyslexia Nigeria. We can do pre-employment pre screening for you um, or teach you how to go about doing that. And for the individual themselves, what do you do if you recognize that, you know, some of these signs you've seen, perhaps uh, difficulty meeting deadlines or concentrating or multitasking um, are challenges for you? What can you do? Know the signs of dyslexia um, and then reach out to an expert and get a workplace needs assessment or a diagnostic assessment. The reason why it's important is because it helps you look at your profile of strengths and weaknesses, and that helps you know, well, what tasks am I really good at? What should I focus on? And what part of my job can sometimes bring about the areas that I have challenges with? So that you know what strategies you can put in place to cope day to day. And those are the things really, I think, on both sides of the coin that help people cope and, and help us realize that there's nothing to be ashamed of with being dyslexic. And people forget things all the time, but we all have strategies. People sometimes just need help to put those strategies in place. And, and, and I think with that, you know, on both the employer and the employee side and with colleagues, um, it can be really easy and very successful to work with and as a dyslexic person. And I hope, I hope that answers the questions. Thank you so much. That was actually really insightful, very practical advice. I think that people can really, really implement um, in the workplace. And, and Bright, I'm going to come to you uh, with hopefully maybe some, for some practical advice um, with a slightly different set of stakeholders. So um, Philip uh, mentioned, Bright, that uh, Kenyan reports in Kenya suggest that about 4,000 teenagers have gotten pregnant in one country. And he's sort of asking what, what can be done for these girls who are undergoing a lot of social stigma. And, you know, you connected that, um, you know, sort of teenage pregnancy with mental health issues. Um, it, or do you have any thoughts on how that, um, that demographic of people, um, you know, how, how can they be assisted maybe specifically? 
Yeah, I think the first thing that needs to be done for, uh, for that is for the people who are responsible to be held um, legally responsible. Uh, that's the first step to, towards even healing for these girls who've been exploited. And second, um, uh, there needs to be now uh, probably safe houses because some of these abuses are occurring within the home uh, where it is the guardian or the parent of the girl who's exploiting the girl. So we need to invest, um, uh, and, and, and this is going to come from probably the government or you know, uh, some of these INGOs, uh, invest in safe houses where girls have an opportunity to run away from home if they're living in really adverse situations and have a safe haven where they can get an intervention. So I think those two areas, first of all, uh, having policy where people who are doing these things are held, because in Kenya, We've seen so many cases of children being exploited and the man or, or the people who are involved go scot-free. So um, that, that, then that the message you're passing to the people, to the wider public is, you can do this and get away with it. And to the girl, the message you're telling her is, you have no power, you have no uh, recourse. So if, I think if those things are done, uh, that's going to address the situation. Uh, at this time. So the, the good thing is the government has data ready. So that means they've identified individuals uh, who uh, have gone through this. So do we now go into the next step of investing in that? Um, I hope we do that. Great, great, right. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I see a question from Kristen uh, that, that's slightly related. And I mean, this is sort of open to, to any of the speakers, but her question is is coming from institutions, right? So, so how do, um, for instance, places like Mathare Hospital in Kenya, how do these institutions protect workers and clients um, despite the fact that they're underfunded? Um, are they receive? Do you know if they're receiving any type of support during this time? Um, you know, from from either public public institutions or private institutions. Um, so, just wondering, you know. It, especially during this time, institutions that are housing people, how are they, um, how are they coping and managing during this time? And that's open for any of, this, any of the speakers, if anyone has thoughts on that. Okay, maybe I could respond to that. As far as I know, there, there hasn't been much of an intervention um, in terms of mental health uh, facilities. The government did put out uh, a, a statement on mental health, on how to manage it, especially around COVID, but in terms of investing in the infrastructure and the healthcare workforce, there hasn't been an investment. Okay, so definitely an area of, of need then for that. Um, and uh, Nomfundo, I'm, I'm not sure if you're still on the line with us, um, but I saw that you were also sort of responding to, to some of the, the next question, but I'll leave it open to any of the speakers as well. There were several questions sort of coming in from Safia, from John, um, really looking at this from some sort of a place of collaboration. You know, how, how do we create an ecosystem uh, of collaboration for sharing resources across the continent? Um, I think this conversation is one way that we can sort of start that. Um, so that was Safia's question, how do we create that ecosystem? And John's question, which was very related, was, you know, how do we leverage on existing programs um, and systems to really accelerate what's working? Um, would be keen for, for any one of you of the speakers. Um, I know Nampundo was, was sort of mentioning on the chat, but if she's, if she's dropped off, um, would, be, would be welcome to hear from any of you. Yeah, maybe I can just speak on, on that also briefly. Oh, um, using the Cradle Arts Festival that I just mentioned earlier, we want to uh, have it as a platform where we are raising awareness uh, on a continental level about mental health, but also using it as a call to action uh, to create a mental health marketplace. So we are actually in the process of collecting data on organizations across the continent where people can then in one, in one place go and access some mental health resources. If someone is coming in from Rwanda, they can go on the, on the website and see what organizations or what uh, interventions are there in their communities that they can reach out to. Or if they're not there, what is happening in another country that I can use technology to reach out to. So that's one of the things. Um, the other thing is I think that, that, that needs to be done is partnerships. We need more partnerships as mental health organizations. 
uh, to merge our ideas and um, make iterations to our approach and come up probably with a singular uh, approach that's uh, that's then uh, impactful and and is cross cutting uh, across across um, all segments. I know that's a huge challenge, uh, but that's something that I think uh, through uh, persistent efforts you're going to get to. Great, thanks so much, Bright. Um, uh, Dr. Wanjiro, I wanna come to you with, with the next uh, question. We had some really, really interesting questions uh, from a couple of folks on, on sort of the connections from mental health to other societal issues. So there's a question um, from Kristen again on, is there a relationship of, of mental health during COVID and sort of the race issues that we're seeing happen across the world and not just in the US, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter riots. Um, there's another question that very closely sort of related saying, how, how are we linking gender-based violence with mental health? So clearly these, you know, are these things interrelated? Um, and if so, sort of how, how do we work on addressing things that, that it's, it's a complicated, it's a complicated uh, issue, right? So, so how do we look at it from, from all these different facets? Okay, um, thank you for that question. I think I would, I, would, I would look at it from two different perspectives. So for one, we're building resilient communities. And so resilient communities are communities that can stand in the face of various traumas and still um, not, start, not be devastated by them. And one of the things that are a key element of building a resilient community are justice, justice, equity, um, and equality. So as, as, you, as you look at it from a community perspective of the collective trauma that may have resulted from, you know, for example, in the case of, of the Black Lives Matter movement and the, and the racism conversation there, you have um, years of systemic racism. And so you have a community that has collective trauma, so to speak. And even to bring it back home a little bit, um, as, 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 as Africans and as, as Kenyans specifically, we have you know, this racism, inherited racism from colonialism. Then we have racism from how we have felt, the, how our interactions with our leaders and how in the ways in which we felt um, disappointed or let down. So there is that element of like a community building, com building uh, systems that make the community uh, more resilient, make the nation more resilient. This will be based on interventions that generally make it a more just place to live, more equitable and where the disparities are not as glaring as they are now. And then now I would like to move it down to what is essentially the individual level of how do you build resilience in an individual? So just assuming that the situation does not change, the context does not change, how can I as an individual face what is essentially a time of difficulty and a time of, of hardship and come out with my mental health intact? And so that is a very different conversation from building resilience for community. And this now is where we have the seven C's of resilience that include coping, control. And because we have not traditionally been taught how to cope as part of you know, learning, um, we, we kind of have to have a crash course on how to cope with difficulty. And so this is where it's, where it's important now to have for example, the intervention of community health workers or one-on-one -on -one, um, coaching with people and, and to start to reach into each other's lives to promote better coping mechanisms, to promote, you know, um, better, better health, mental health practices around this. And sometimes, it, it, because digital is a double-edged sword, Digital, we have an increased like, we have an increase in anxiety because now you're so acutely aware of what is happening in the world and it affects you deeply you at the click of a button on your phone you can just go online and see oh no you can watch literally watch the entire murder of a man right before your very eyes but digital is a two-edged sword because on the other hand it is a place for healing you have all these resources that you have access to and that you can if you are purposeful, purposeful about it you can start to that you know help your mental health you can seek out information that that makes you better um, now for the for this is for an audience such as ourselves who have access to this technology but there are people who don't have access to this uh, to this technology and these are 
people in the villages who are still facing this, and that's where community health workers come in. And these are community leaders. They're well known in the community, and they can go home to home, identify what are the challenges. They can identify this is a stressed environment. This is a this is a place that has anxiety. They might be able to identify abuse. So on that ground level, we have to also strengthen those systems on a very basic level of the people who come into direct contact with the general population. Thank you, thank you so much. That, that's fantastic. Um, I actually want to tie some of, some of your comments and sort of throw this back to Olaide. Um, there have been a, several questions um, around how, um, how, how, how we can reach families for early intervention. And there was another question specifically about how, you know, if you guys are working specifically with corporates on raising awareness. So again, sort of how, how are we addressing that as this a, a systemic issue? Um, how do you reach families for, for early detection and awareness? How do you reach corporates um, for detection in the workplace? I don't know if you have any comments uh, specifically on that for your work with dyslexia. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for those questions. Um, we absolutely are reaching families for dyslexia, um, and we do that in a variety of ways. So we work with schools. Um, so we most likely are in contact with your school or your school can contact us. And that way we can reach parent teachers associations, all the parents, we reach staff, we go to schools to make awareness presentations. So even children themselves can identify whether or not they have some signs or symptoms. We work with the government, so we're currently working with the government on how to get more awareness into schools and um, universal screening into schools as well. Again, early detection is very important. The earlier you can catch it, the earlier you can, you can teach people how to cope with dyslexia, and then it doesn't become a challenge throughout the rest of their lives. And with, with corporates, we absolutely do work with corporates as well. Um, like you know, our conversation here has gone. There's so many adults in the workplace who are also struggling. We do awareness presentations in, in organizations. So we just go there and have a really brief 15 minute conversation with all your staff about dyslexia um, and answer questions. But we also provide training so we can have more in-depth training on dyslexia in the workplace. What are the signs? How can you cope, et cetera. Beyond that, then we do um, assessments, diagnostic assessments and workplace needs assessments. So the more in-depth assessment then to develop the profile of strengths and weaknesses, and also to show how you can cope specifically on the job that you are in. We go to churches to create awareness in churches. I know that many people who might not be in school or in the workplace might also be in churches we're there as well. Um, we go to mosques too. So really where there is a gathering of people, um, because the sex care cuts across all ages, um, both genders, it cuts across, you know, all different ways that we categorize ourselves, religions and, and all whatnot. So when different places that we can reach people um, and, you know, we encourage people, you know, dyslexia happens on a spectrum. You don't have to be, you know, on the far extreme of dyslexia to suffer from some of the challenges that it brings with working memory or organization or attention. And so if you feel that you are having some of those signs, it is worth checking, am I dyslexic? Or beyond that, to just come along and have, you know, some working memory training or attention programming. We have some therapies we can work with you on to just help to improve those parts of your executive functioning, whether or not you think you are on the far extreme of dyslexia or not. Um, same goes in terms of awareness with going to hospitals because some people do think dyslexia is a medical issue. They might be in the hospitals. So we're in hospitals too to say, you know, if you see this science, this is not a medical issue. It's a learning issue. It's a way the brain processes information and there's so many ways that we can help. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you so much. And I'm going to come to Bright, but in the, in the interim, uh, if anyone wants from the audience wants to contribute anything, please just, just put your hand up um, or message in the chat box so that, that we can unmute you and, and come to you. But 
we would welcome some some comments you know from from the audience if anyone else has experience that they would like to share um, from their work you know there's there's some really interesting side conversations and that's I want to sort of give the floor to bright here um, there was an interesting conversation uh, around sort of technology and access um, and a couple of webinars ago on this series we had one specifically you know looking looking at access um, access to information and there's a whole challenge around um, access to internet um, and I know bright you sort of mentioned in the chat that the mobile penetration for Kenya is 91 percent um, but but I mean, we're talking, we're sort of having a pan-African conversation here and that might not be the case across the continent, right? So, um, you know, when, when sort of social distancing and all of this is an issue, sort of how, you know, how do you reach a population and if they might not be, um, they might not have access to the internet. So you're focusing on, on SMS platforms or sort of, you know, low tech versions. Um, and and, and some, someone else brought up um, John uh, brought up the question right around you know different approaches and technological systems that that can help address some of these mental health issues so um, so bright maybe do you want to just give some remarks and thoughts on on sort of the the enablement of technology to assist some of these things and what you see working um, with mental 360 that that you think might um, might shed some light yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Um, yeah, uh, internet penetration uh, is very low, especially in low income communities. Uh, but the beautiful thing with Kenya, for example, is the penetration for mobile phones is at 91%. And across Africa, it is at 83%. And so it's very possible to reach all communities uh, through an SMS platform. So if you can recruit uh, community leaders uh, who then go through a training to be or to be able to offer psychological first aid and be the first point of contact within a community. It is a model that can really work well. So that for any uh, severe cases that need referral, they either refer to a community center or they know they have a helpline that they can call to get uh, intervention for those who are, who are offline. Uh, also, I talked about this app that needs to be contextualized to the needs of Africa or the needs of uh, uh, people in low income communities. And so one of the things we are having on the app is um, an offline, so that you don't need internet to be able to access. Uh, now, when I'm speaking about, and I know this is a bit, uh, a bit uh, in line with Metro 360 as an organization because we are targeting the youth uh, in Kenya, um, we have I, I, I think that the figures were over 80% of youth uh, who are using smartphones. Um, and so when they're using smartphones, we then they don't have data, they can't access the internet. We have an offline mechanism is within the app that they can access basic information on mental health and referral pathways. So those are some of the things we're looking at and we'll need a lot of uh, support and expertise to actually uh, make it um, real or to, to make it a reality. Fantastic. So really, it seems to be a very common thread around this sense, sense of community. How do, you, how do you really engage at a community level, um, at, at, at a really system-wide level to, to address this? And I realize we're, we're really running out of time, um, but the last question that I'm going to ask is, is actually from Frank, um, which is a fantastic question I think to sort of close with is, you know, how, how differently um, is me are mental health issues um, surfacing in Africa that are different from other parts of the world that we've seen? Um, and, and I mean, how, how in this sense, sort of how, how are we unique? Uh, Bright, you've been talking a lot about the youth and teenage pregnancy. Um, you know, I mean, just, just and I'll open this to, to any one of the speakers, or if you all just want to take a quick, you know, 30 seconds to give your, your, your comments there, um, and, then, and then we'll start to wrap up. But I think it's interesting to look at this in, in the context of this is a global issue, but I think it's effect affecting those of us, you know, in Africa very differently. Okay, I could, I could try and respond to that. I think a study was done by the University of Nebraska that was looking at online sentiments post-COVID and post the lockdown, um, and looking particularly at, at online sentiment in the U.S. and seeing what are some of the things that stood out um, as a result of, of, of COVID. And there was a peak in drug abuse, there was a peak in um, misuse of opiates, 
um, that are traditionally for pain. There was an increase in alcoholism. So with with the with with the West, so to speak, there has been uh, towards, towards substance abuse. That's that's been more that's been more very clear in in that. Um, I think for a situation here, because there has not necessarily been uh, a, a study per se, what was done by Nendo, which is a digital research team, is they looked at sentiment for, on COVID. And, and here we see the online sentiment is mostly directed towards government. So there's a frustration towards government here. Um, there's a frustration towards powers of structure. There's a feeling of, of there's a sense of being let down. Um, also, because maybe the the resources are, resources are distributed between you know between the two contexts, as as Fred would, as as, as I would contrast them, is different. So you have issues more of self of the isolation. Um, people are feeling that more. Of course, it's being felt across the board, but in the West, that has been one of the biggest one of the bigger concerns and the bigger fears. I think as as Africans, we have had. The experience of um, you know community communication and behavior change. We pretty much we we know the drill around public health. We've gone through HIV. Um, some places have gone through Ebola. So we know the drill around behavior change and public health. So for us, social isolation, whereas it has had its effects, has not been as great as maybe in in the West. And and for us, the things that we are struggling with are more are more survival. Whereas in the West, the issues have been more existential. Very, very interesting. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wunjuru. Uh, Bright or Oleida, do you want to make any sort of closing comments as, as we wrap up here, either on that particular uh, question or generally? Uh, Oleida, um, yeah. go ahead. Maybe Oleida first and, and then Bright. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much. I, I mean, I think my fingers have been quite busy on the chat box just to share any contact, share our contact information and anyone is most welcome to contact us by email, by WhatsApp, on social media. We're happy to, take, to answer any questions you have and take the conversation forward. Um, and thank you so much for this opportunity to have contributed to this conversation. It's very important to us and we're really, really glad to have been able to share something we hope is, is, is useful. Mental health remains something that's very fragile, very sensitive, um, something that we're still learning to embrace in our part of the world and therefore something that, that really is killing us without us recognizing it as, as quickly as we should. And so I think conversations like this um, remain so, so important. Um, and we'll always see the relevance of this in everything that goes on around us, whether it be Black Lives Matter or with COVID-19 or whatever next thing comes up. Um, at the end of the day, human beings as, as energy and emotions, you know, our mental health is really, really critical. And I think having a framework to think about, well, how does this affect me and those around me um, is something that we, we will need to be able to, to survive whatever comes our way. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, and, and we will be circulating all of the speakers' um, information and details uh, and, and all the hotlines, I think, that have been sort of populating on the chat. We'll circulate that as well, sort of post the webinar. Um, Bright, over to you, last, last few comments. Yeah, uh, my closing comments are just going to uh, mention on that mental health for me, and I think for a lot of people from the poll we've seen today, is a social problem arising from the social stigma. And despite all the interventions you might put in terms of giving medication and, um, and everything else, therapy, as long as this individual is going back to a toxic environment, then their mental health will always be in jeopardy. And so we see a need to address this problem through um, uh, social systems, through policy change, through more awareness creation for each household. I saw a very good quote in the comments from, I think, Faith or someone. Uh, that you need to start at the household level uh, for the father, the mother, the brother to understand what mental health is. And we see the easiest way, again, is through art. Uh, music, poetry has been used as a very powerful tool uh, to effect change uh, in history. 
And uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are working on this festival. Those of uh, you who'd love to hear more about it, please reach out. Those of you who'd love to partner, let's work together. Let's make it have continental or even global impact. And I'm looking forward to having conversations with a lot of you moving forward. Thank you so much, Ariel. Thank you so much, Bright. Um, and I think at this point, I just wanted to thank everyone for, for joining us and for sticking with us. I, I think, um, we, I think we, we blocked maybe an hour of people's time and I think a lot of us have stuck through an hour and a half. Um, I wanted to hand it over to Nancy as well from AVPA to just make some, uh, a few closing remarks, but thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and we really, we really appreciate having this really, really relevant and, and important conversation um, and really, really excited to see the, how active the chat is and how many people are already talking about partnerships and ways to collaborate together. And that's exactly why we're doing this. Um, so thank you everyone for your participation. And Nancy, over to you. Thank you, Ariel. Uh, thank you to Sanka Help Dialogue for partnering with AVPA to host these uh, the series of webinars, Crushing the Curve. Um, I just wanted to bring to everybody's attention, um, one of our largest donors um, at AVPA is the USADF, uh, or United States Africa Development Foundation. Not, not USAID, they're different from USAID. Um, and uh, they're, like I said, they're one of our biggest donors. It's an independent uh, US government agency. Um, and have been for the last five years, as you can see in that slide, um, have actually invested more than $115 million directly into uh, over 1,000 African owned and operated entities and impacted over 4 million lives. So uh, we thank USADF for their support of um, our organization. And if, you, if any of you would like to reach out to them, there's information at the bottom of that slide and we'll be circulating it later to, to all uh, participants and speakers. So thank you very much, USADF. And thank you to all the speakers today. I think um, the, the conversation has really been robust and eye-opening. I was really uh, quite startled at the figures around um, uh, suicide levels, especially amongst men. And um, this is an issue that um, I, I thought other people would kind of pick up, and the participants would pick up and talk more about, but I think it's a very sad situation. We need to really look into that uh, deeper. And even the figures that we're seeing around uh, young girls uh, getting pregnant, 4,000 young girls reported yesterday um, who are, have been impregnated in just one county in, in Kenya. Uh, just in the last two to three months. So these are really, really sad issues and serious issues. And uh, maybe we'll follow up with other webinars to uh, delve into some of these subjects uh, more closely. But thank you very much to everybody. Um, have a very nice uh, rest of the week and weekend. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see some information if you want to reach out to anybody at AVPA. Um, those are uh, some of the contact uh, information. Thank you and uh, stay well. Keep safe.